In this video, we're going to talk about how you can save a lot of money by using tax loopholes. So hit that subscribe button and turn on that notification bell so you stay educated on how your money works. Tax avoidance strategies aren't solely for the rich. Plenty of tax deductions and credits are available for middle and low income taxpayers too. You might be able to take advantage of the best tax loopholes to lower your tax bill. Tax loopholes are simply legal ways to use the tax code to save yourself money. Different loopholes exist for different levels of income. Whether your income is low, high, or in the middle, tax loopholes can save you a lot of money. So let's first talk about tax loopholes for low income earners. Some tax loopholes come in the form of tax credits designed specifically for lower income taxpayers. Two types of credits are available. First, refundable credits. This enables taxpayers to receive refunds even when they have zero tax liability. And second, non-refundable credits. This enables taxpayers to reduce their tax liability but does not increase their refunds. Then first, let's talk about the American Opportunity Tax Credit. This is an educational tax benefit that replaces and expands on the HOPE credit. It applies to the first four years of college educational expenses and provides a tax break for expenses including tuition, books, and other supplies. The credit is worth up to $2,500 per eligible student, and its most attractive feature might be the fact that you're refunded 40% of your total credit, $1,000 maximum, that exceeds your tax liability. In other words, if your tax bill is $1,000 but you earn $2,000 in refundable tax credits, you're entitled to a refund of $400. 40% of the $1,000 that exceeds your tax liability. To claim the full amount of the American Opportunity Tax Credit, you must have a modified adjusted gross income of $80,000 or less, or $160,000 or less if you're married and filing jointly. The allowable amount of your credit falls as your income rises. Once you top $90,000 or $180,000 if you're married and filing jointly, you're no longer eligible for the credit. Number two, Savers Tax Credit. This is formally known as the Retirement Savings Contribution Credit, which is designed to help lower income families contribute to retirement plans. If you qualify, this credit essentially pays you to put money in your retirement account. You can write off the first $2,000 or $4,000 for married couples filing jointly. Whether you can claim the credit depends on your income and filing status. To qualify, you must not be a full-time student or be claimed as a dependent on someone else's tax return. You must also be at least 18 years of age. To claim the Savers Credit, if you're married and filing jointly, it's $24,000. If you're filing as head of household, it's $48,000. And if you're another filer, that's $32,000. The amount of your credit will be 10%, 20%, or 50% of your contribution, depending on your adjusted gross income. For example, if you're married and filing jointly in tax return 2020, you can claim the 50% credit if your adjusted gross income is $38,500 or less. An income of $38,501 to $41,500 entitles you to a 20% credit, and an income of $41,501 to $64,000 nets you a 10% credit. And number three is to earn income tax credit. This was designed specifically to assist low to moderate income families. Even single taxpayers can benefit from the credit, however. Income and the number of children in your household determine the amount of the credit. Last year, the income limit ranged from $15,507 if you're single and have no children to $55,952 if you're married and filing jointly and have three or more qualified children. The maximum amount of earned income tax credit is $65,557 for three or more qualified children, $5,800 for two qualifying children, $3,500 for one qualified child, and $529 if you don't have any kids. You must qualify for the credit by having business income or income from a job. When you're claiming a qualified child, they must be younger than 19 years of age unless they're enrolled as a full-time student, in which case the age limit rises to 24. So now let's talk about tax loopholes for the middle class. In general, income tax loopholes for individuals in this category are harder to come by, as fade-out rules make them ineligible for a number of credits and deductions. Many credits are designed to help lower income taxpayers or pertain specifically to high earners, however. Some credits and deductions are still available to middle income earners. First is the mortgage interest deduction. For middle income taxpayers, your best chance for scoring a big tax break is with your home. When you buy a home, you can claim the mortgage interest deduction, which allows you to deduct the interest portion of your mortgage payment, but not the principal. In other words, you can't write off your entire monthly payment, but you can deduct the interest payments you've made all year with a qualifying mortgage. The deduction can be a big tax saver in cases where it makes sense to itemize deductions. When the amount of your mortgage interest deductions exceeds your standard deductions, you'll save more money if you itemize. The standard deduction amount are $12,200 for single filers or married filing separately, 
$18,350 for head of households, and $24,400 for married filing jointly. Individuals aged 65 and older and blind individuals qualify for an additional standard deduction, $1,650 for single or head of household filing status, or $1,300 for married taxpayers and qualifying widows and widowers. Second is the lifetime earnings credit. This is an educational tax credit that's similar to the American Opportunity Tax Credit for low-income individuals. However, when you claim one of these two tax credits, you cannot claim the other for the same student. Unlike the refundable American Opportunity Tax Credit, the Lifetime Earnings Credit is non-refundable. You can claim the Lifetime Earnings Credit for an unlimited number of tax years, whereas the American Opportunity Tax Credit has a four-year max. The Lifetime Earnings Credit lets you claim up to 20% of the first $10,000 in qualifying expenses, up to $2,000 per tax return, to help offset the educational costs of a qualifying student. The credit comes with relatively high income caps, $133,999 if you're married and filing jointly, or $66,999 if you're filing as a single, head of household, or a qualified widower. The lifetime earnings credit gradually phases out for single filers with income of $57,000 or more and taxpayers who are married and filing jointly with an income of $114,000 or more. You can't claim the credit if you're married and filing separately. The tax credit is available regardless of your age as long as it goes towards a qualifying educational expense. Acceptable expenses include tuition, student activity fees, course-related books, supplies, and equipment. Third is the child tax credit. This is for taxpayers with qualifying children, and they can claim this on top of the earned income credit and credit for child and dependent care expenses. The child tax credit can be worth up to $2,000 per child living in your household, and it's partially refundable. It allows you to get back up to $1,400 even if you don't owe taxes before claiming the refund, as long as your family income is at least $2,500. To qualify, you must claim the child as a dependent on your taxes, and the child must have a social security number, be age 16 or younger at the end of the year, and be currently living with you for at least half the year. A $500 non-refundable credit can be applied to eligible dependents who can't be claimed for the child tax credit. You might qualify for the full child tax or dependent credit if your income is $200,000 for single file status or $400,000 for married filing jointly. And four, retirement savings accounts. Although taxpayers of all income levels are eligible to contribute to a retirement savings account, the tax benefits are typically more accessible to middle income earners. Low income payers can't really afford to contribute the maximum amount to retirement accounts and higher income earners are ineligible for tax breaks on certain accounts. However, the benefits can be huge for those who can afford to contribute to retirement accounts. Contributions to employer-sponsored 401k plans and individual retirement accounts are eligible for tax deductions that can reduce your total taxable income. For example, if you contribute $5,000 to your company 401k plan, the amount of your taxable income drops by $5,000. If you're in the 25% tax bracket, it amounts to savings of $1,250 in federal taxes. Retirement accounts offer more than just an immediate tax benefit. As long as you keep the money in the account, it grows tax deferred. For a regular brokerage account, you would owe taxes annually on dividends and capital gains payouts, but if you have a retirement account, you pay taxes only when you make a withdrawal from the account. Contributions to a Roth IRA don't qualify for a tax deduction at the time you make the deposit. Instead, you would draw your earnings and contributions tax-free once you're 59 and a half. Roth IRA contributions come from the post-tax income. You pay taxes on your income now, but not in the future. You don't get the immediate tax breaks for Roth IRAs like you do for pre-tax accounts like traditional IRAs and 401k plans. So then let's talk about tax loopholes for the rich. High income taxpayers face both challenges and benefits when it comes to tax loopholes. On one hand, having a high income makes taxpayers ineligible for a lot of tax breaks, or at least reduces their benefits. On the other hand, many tax breaks are more beneficial for the wealthy and amplify their savings because they pay a high tax rate. One is the capital gains tax. Although the capital gains tax loophole is available to all taxpayers of all income levels, it benefits high income earners the most. The reason comes down to the progressive structure of the tax system. The special tax rate on capital gains is beneficial to high income earners because the tax on long-term capital gains and dividend income for most taxpayers is 15% to 20%, depending on their income level. Exceptions include the higher 25% tax rate on unrecaptured Section 1250 gains, which is the type of depreciation recapture income relies on the sale of depreciable real estate and the 28% tax rate on the sale of collectibles or small business stocks. Meanwhile, the tax rate on high income earners can be as high as 37%. This disparity in rates can translate to great tax savings. For example, say you're in the highest tax bracket and about to receive a $100,000 windfall. 
When this money is taxed as ordinary income, you'll owe as much as $37,000 in federal income tax. But if this income comes in the form of capital gains, you pay only $23,800 in federal income tax. Number two, high income mortgage interest deductions. The mortgage interest deduction for middle income earners can benefit high income earners even more at tax time. Statistically, high income earners are more likely to itemize deductions rather than take the standard deduction. Additionally, high income filers tend to have a larger mortgage payment, which increases the potential amount for their mortgage interest deductions. For example, you generally need a high income to get a mortgage for $1 million. If you're paying interest on a mortgage that large, you'll have more interest to deduct than the taxpayer who pays interest on a $350,000 mortgage. But there's a limit to this loophole. The IRS only allows mortgage deductions on up to $750,000 in loans to buy or repair a home. Therefore, the super wealthy with multi-million dollar homes won't benefit any more than high income taxpayers with a mortgage of $750,000. In addition to mortgage interest deduction, you can deduct the interest you pay on a home equity loan used to build, buy, or substantially improve the primary or secondary home you're borrowing against. The only caveats are that the home equity loan and the first mortgage cannot total more than $750,000, and the total loan amount cannot exceed the cost of the home. And there's also more good news. You can deduct up to $10,000 of property tax or $5,000 if you're married and filing separately. And number three, the carried interest loophole. This basically applies to high income taxpayers only. Venture capitalists, hedge fund managers, and partners in private equity firms are eligible for special tax treatment based solely on their occupations. The carried interest loophole is a variation on the capital gains tax benefit. Paid compensation in these professions is considered a distribution of investment fund profits, which is also called carried interest. Because this income is regarded as an investment profit rather than a salary or a wage, it's taxed at the long-term capital gains rate instead of a regular income tax rate, which can be significant for those in high income tax brackets. For example, a $1 million salary would be subject to a 37% tax rate plus a 3.8% net investment income tax, which would come out to $408,000. When salary is considered carried interest, however, that same $1 million would be subject to only the top 20% capital gains plus a 3.8% net investment income tax, which would come out to $238,000. So regardless of your income level, plenty of tax loopholes exist that you can use. From educational credits to savings on retirement contributions, there are likely deductions or savings that are relevant to you. So what are your thoughts? Are you in the low, middle, or are you high income taxpayer? Leave a comment down below and let's get a discussion started. And as always, take care of your money. Today's book of the day is You Are a Badass at Making Money by Jin Sincero. I'll leave a link to the book down below. And if you prefer listening to it on an audiobook for free, I'll also leave a link to a 30-day free trial to Audible. You can choose this book or any book to listen to. And even if you cancel before your free trial is over, you can still keep the book and listen to it whenever you want. Last thing before you go, a financial education is the most important kind of education you can give your kids. That's why I created Smart Money Parenting as a way to prepare you and your kids about the highs and lows of managing your own money. I'll leave a link to the course down below so you can check it out.